things during pregnancy. Why is that? Because the baby, as it's developing, is stealing minerals from the mother, and if she's not taking in enough to counteract that, they crave things. In the Old South, where they have the heart attack, stroke, and cancer belt of America, they eat um, cornstarch. How many of you have heard of women eating cornstarch when they're pregnant? Yeah. And what about clay? They go out in the yard and eat clay when they're pregnant. People come and say, Doc, am I sick? Am I crazy? I, I have this craving for clay. No, you're just pregnant, my dear. It's so common in the Old South. You go to a grocery store into the dairy section, they got these little bags of yellow clay, red clay, orange clay, blue clay, black clay. You can have your choice. Whichever one flips your switch. I love this one. came out in October of last year. Eating dirt may be good for you. Don't take vitamins and minerals. You can overdose, but eat dirt. <laughs> Experts claim the habit of eating clay may be beneficial for pregnant women. Now, what is in clay? Clay is minerals. <laughs> and the woman says, the real good stuff is smooth. Tastes just like candy. Mm. The habit of eating clay or dirt is known as geophagy, geo for earth and phagy for eat. Some experts lump it into the same category as pica, which is the uh, abnormal urge to eat coins, paint, soap, and other non-food items such as wood ashes, plant minerals. And so there was a natural drive for pregnant women at the dawn of history to eat wood ashes and dirt and clay and things looking for minerals as those babies drove them to be minerally deficient. I could say a lot of things about a lot of diseases, but I'm going to just go to selenium when it comes to cancer because Dr. Schrauser did such an eloquent job. You've all heard my tape. I hope you've all heard the tape, but dead doctors don't lie. And on there, I was reading this, and of course, doctors turned me over to every agency in the world because I had found an anti-cancer diet. I was just reading this, and of course, when I made that tape, I was just reading it. An anti-cancer diet has been found. They interpreted that I was claiming that I had made an anti-cancer diet. And what they did was look at these vitamins and minerals. And uh, dietary supplements such as vitamin C, retinol, which is a form of vitamin A, zinc, riboflavin, vitamin B2, and molybdenum, which is a trace mineral, niacin B3, had no statistically significant effect on cancer or deaths over the five years. Well, it takes a little bit longer for them to do things. However, in a group of middle-aged people, I think there was 29,000 people between the age of 49 and 60, during the same five-year period, those who took only beta-carotene, vitamin E, and the trace mineral selenium for five years, the results were striking. 13% fewer deaths from all cancers, 20% reduction deaths from stomach cancer, which is very high in that portion of China, and a 9% disappearance of deaths from all causes, just by taking those three supplements. And of course, they were very low doses. They were just a portion of the RDA. Well, in 1912, 1912 in Popular Mechanics, that wonderful medical journal, written so you can understand it, Dr. Wasserman, who invented the Wasserman test, which is that blood test a lot of his old guys had to take before he got married to get a license, detected syphilis. He either had an active case of syphilis. Hua. He had discovered a chemical substance, which turned out to be selenium, that will cure cancer in mice. He went on to say that selenium has a selective action against cancer cells, but didn't hurt healthy tissues. He went on to say that the cancer in mice is so similar to that in humans, he believed that an important advance had been made toward the cure of that veritable scourge cancer in people. Well, in 1912, when this came out, we began to put selenium into animal foods. It stayed dormant in interest to medical doctors until December of 1996, 84 years later, when this came out, uh, Dr. Larry Clark, a medical doctor, I have to give him credit, medical doctor, PhD from the University of Arizona, and he did the gold standard in medical research. He did a randomized double-blind study in 1,300 people for seven years. Half of them got 200 micrograms or one-fifth of a milligram of selenium. The other half got sugar pills or placebos. And to make a long story short, his final analysis showed taking selenium slashed the occurrence, not the risk, but slashed the actual occurrence, which is much more powerful than slashing the risk slashed the occurrence of prostate cancer by 69%, colorectal cancer by 64%, and lung cancer by 39%. Well, two months after this wonderful news came out, Dr. Larry Clark, MD, PhD, dies of prostate cancer at age 52. He didn't take selenium because he didn't believe in it. He actually purposely avoided selenium because he believed in chemotherapy because that's how he made his living. And so it cost him his life. He didn't even make it to 56, died of 52 of prostate cancer. Nobody should die of prostate cancer. No link found between fat and breast cancer. High fiber diets don't protect you. Multivitamins cut colon cancer risk. 90,000 nurses, Harvard Nurses Health Study. 15 years on a multivitamin. Reduce the risk of colon cancer by 75% in these 90,000 women. Reduce the risk of colon cancer by 75% for like $2 a day. Are there any drugs that will reduce the risk of colon cancer by 1%? No. Here's a little nutritional formula will reduce your risk of colon cancer by 75%. It's going to cost you half of what it costs for an espresso latte from Starbucks. And people say, I don't know, I, I, I can't remember to do that in the morning. Well, then die. <laughs> Hoo -ah. Hoo -ah. 
And so, fortunately, there's always a small group of people who will survive. Just like in Katrina, there was a group of people who, when they got the word on Thursday that it was coming, and the storm filled the entire Gulf of Mexico, or as they say in Texas, the entire Gulf of Mexico, they, they little old people, little bags of water, they start walking west. Three days later when it hit, they were 100 miles away. And the ones who stayed, eh, the government will save us. <laughs> that female will do it. <laughs> Don't forget the bird flu. Okay, I think I get diabetes and arthritis in the last 10 minutes I have here. There's a diabetes epidemic. There's a million new cases in 2000, and last year in 2005, there was 1.6 million new cases. It went up more than 50% in four years. Went up more than 50% in four years, despite all this wondrous medical care, and that's why we now rank 46th in the world in health and longevity. And so all the insulin and all the exercise programs and all the amputations and all the blindness and all the stuff we go through is unnecessary. We can eliminate high blood pressure and diabetes in the black community, the white community, the human community in 90 days if everybody would do the right thing. And so uh, we have loved ones, we have family, we have church mates, we have workmates, we have neighbors. We, we have to help them. All will not listen. And I used to get all, I must be doing something wrong. I, I should be able to get people to realize how important this is. And then I think back to Jesus. Did everybody believe Jesus? And the answer is no. Did everybody follow his word? No. And so who am I to think that I should get 100%? And so I said, okay. And so you have to realize, and don't take it personal, when 85% of the people say, no, no, I've got a good doctor. No, no, my, my blood sugar is under control. It's 140 every morning. I, I got my cholesterol under control. I'm taking those <laughs> statin drugs. <laughs> Everything's fine. I'm healthy. Diabetes rate soars for Americans in their 30s. It used to be called adult onset type 2 diabetes because it only occurred in people over age 50. Well, now newborn babies are having it. Minority kids have the worst risk. If you take the white kids out of the ratios... It's not 16% of the kids that have obesity and diabetes. Guess what? It's 50% of the kids. Okay? It's the Hispanics, the Native Americans, the black community. And that's because, not genetic, it's because of how they eat. Heavy kids getting grown-up diseases. Scary diagnosis. I remember talking, this kid here is only 12 years old. He weighed 328 pounds. High blood pressure, clogged arteries, diabetes showing up in babies. Is that because it's genetic? No, it's because they're eating fried foods. They're living on soft drinks and Pop-Tarts and Pillsbury toaster strudels and apple juice. My fear is everybody in America is going to eat dry cereal and, and apple juice for breakfast. They have peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for lunch. And they come home and they eat Kraft's macaroni and cheese. And they think they're getting good food. And we wonder why they're obese. We wonder why they have diabetes. We wonder why they have growing pains. We wonder why they have ADD. We wonder why they have thyroid problems. We wonder why they have clogged arteries. The doctor says, well, it's genetic. Your great-great-grandfather's dog had it, so therefore, that, you know, that's, uh, I knew it was in your family. This is a big study, 91,000 nurses, eight years, the Harvard Nurses Health Study. This came out in uh, June of 2004. The women in the study who drank at least one sugar-sweetened soda, it didn't matter if it was classic Coke, Pepsi-Cola, Mountain Dew, Sprite, 7-Up, um, ginger ale, natural, organic, carbonated drinks, didn't matter. Pellegrino water, Perrier water, if it's carbonated, club soda, doesn't matter. 85, you're 85% more likely to get diabetes. If you drink two a day, you're going to get it. How many of you have ever seen a teenager just drink two? Unless it's those 42-ounce gulps, each of which has three 12-ounce Cokes in them. There's nine teaspoons of sugar per 12-ounce drink. Now, if they're drinking 10 a day, that's 90 teaspoons of sugar. Put 90 teaspoons of sugar in a mixing bowl and see what your kids are drinking. you got to change it, folks. This is a page out of Rare Earths Forbidden Cures. We we'll just look at chromium as one of the two trace minerals that are missing when you have diabetes. And of course, there's 23 cofactors necessary for them to work. We learned this in 1957 that we could prevent and cure. We could prevent and cure diabetes in laboratory animals, pet animals, and farm animals in 1957 with these two trace minerals. We proved it in human beings 20 years later in 1977. Do doctors use this stuff? No. There's no money in it. There's no money in the cure. The money's in, you're going to be on this insulin for the rest of your life. And so we have to show them that there is an option. Well, 
They went back, the same people who discovered this in 1957 went back to 1948 and they just looked at chromium. 1948, the amount of chromium in American blood was a big range, 28 to 1,000 parts per billion. In 71, it dropped to 13. 72, it dropped to 10. 73, it dropped to 4.7 to 5.1. In 74, it dropped to 0.73 to 1.6. and 78, it dropped to 0.16. In 80, it popped up almost three times, uh, 0.43. That's because in 1977, they came out and said, you can prevent and cure diabetes with these trace minerals. University of Vancouver, British Columbia said you could re replace insulin with these trace minerals. They came out big headlines and said it. And everybody went into the health food store and they tried it. And so everybody's level of, of chromium in their blood went up for a couple of years. And then it dropped back down in 1985 to 0.13 because it wouldn't work. Well, why won't the chromium and vanadium by themselves work? Because they need 23 cofactors. You ever hear me say take chromium and vanadium? No. You take the 90 essential nutrients because they're hooked together like a web. Hooah.